For the Millennial Way Show, I am Ismael Trevino. Harvard astronomy professor Abraham Avilov highly anticipated new book, Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth, is being published January 26, detailing his controversial theory that an artificial object may have been sent to Earth in 2017 from an extraterrestrial civilization. Our next guest, Professor Amy Lopp, was named one of the 25 most influential people in the field of space research by Time Magazine. He was the longest serving chair in the history of the astronomy department in Harvard from 2011 to 2020. He's the founding director of the Black Hole Initiative, also in Harvard University, chair of the Breakthrough Starshot Advisory Committee, also chair from the Board of Physics and Astronomy at the National Academies, member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, as well as the advisory board for the educational platform Einstein Visualize the Impossible, author of five books and more than 800 papers, uh, research papers. Professor Love, thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you today on the Millennial Way Show. Thanks for having me. Professor, first question, simple and straightforward. And this is a question that you highlight uh, in different chapters of your book. Are we alone? This is the centennial question. My guess is probably not because uh, about half of the sun-like stars uh, in the Milky Way galaxy have a planet the size of the Earth roughly at the same distance as the Earth is from the sun. And what that means is that they could have liquid water on their surface and the chemistry of life as we know it. So if you roll the dice billions of times, it's very unlikely that we are alone. Uh, under similar circumstances, you might as well get the same outcome. And moreover, I think uh, we should adapt uh, the principle of modesty, not assume that we are special and unique because that never worked throughout the history of science. Uh, Aristotle argued that we are in the center of the universe. And for a thousand years, people believed him because it gives us priority, privilege. But uh, then Copernicus and Galileo found evidence that actually the earth is moving around the sun. And philosophers didn't want to look through Galileo's telescope. They put him in house arrest. Uh, and they just maintain their ignorance. The earth continued to move around the sun. And we now know that we are not privileged, that earth-sun systems are very common. So if I had to guess by the same principle, I would argue that we are probably not alone, that there are lots of other forms of life out there. And also I would go even farther and say, we're probably not the smartest kid on the block because it's hard for me to imagine that by random processes of mixing chemicals in the early earth, we ended up with the best outcome, which is life as we know it. There are probably better forms of life that, are, that have lasted longer, perhaps have a more advanced technology that they developed. And uh, we should just be modest and look at the sky and try to figure out who is out there. Professor, in your book, Extraterrestrial, how strong is the first sign of intelligent life beyond Earth? Talking about Oumuamua or Scout, as you call it in your, the first chapters of your book. Right. So first, I would like to um, confess that uh, one of the reasons I search for intelligence in outer space is because I don't very often find it here on Earth. When I listen to the morning news every day, it sounds like you know humanity is wasting a lot of resources uh, in destructive actions. Uh, people fight each other uh, rather than collaborate and work together. And uh, uh, therefore, you know, I'm looking out uh, in order to perhaps learn something from uh, civilizations that are more advanced and more intelligent. Now, Oumuamua was the very first object that was discovered in the vicinity of the Earth that came from outside the solar system, from interstellar space. It was discovered in October 2017 by a telescope on Mount Haleakala in Hawaii. And at first, astronomers assumed that this object is just like all the other rocks that we have seen in the solar system, asteroids or comets. They thought it's a comet, 
And the only problem was it didn't have a cometary tail. Uh, so then they said, okay, so it's an asteroid without ice on its surface, so nothing evaporates from it. But then the problem was that it exhibited an extra push away from the sun, in addition to the sun's force of gravity. And um, usually this is provided by cometary evaporation, uh, the rocket effect. So on the one hand, it didn't look like a comet, it didn't lose any gases. And on the other hand, it showed some excess, excess push, which requires for it to lose about a tenth of its mass if it were a comet. And we didn't see any, any gases around it with the Spitzer Space Telescope. So the question was, what gives it this extra push? And uh, I argue that it, it's possible that it's, get, it's getting the extra push from reflecting sunlight. And uh, also when it was tumbling, um, we could tell that uh, it has a very extreme geometry, most likely flat, not uh, cigar shaped as uh, depicted in some cartoons. Uh, based on the amount of reflected sunlight, we could say that it's most likely flat and also with an extreme geometry, much longer than it is thick. And so uh, in order for it to, to uh, get pushed by sunlight, it had to be extremely thin. And we suggested that it may be like a sail uh, on a boat, which is pushed by wind, but except in this case, it's reflected sunlight. And the light sail technology is being developed by us right now uh, for space exploration. Uh, and the advantage of it is the spacecraft doesn't need to carry its fuel with it. So it's possible that this object was manufactured by another civilization. Now, I should say that in uh, September 2020, just a few months ago, there was another object discovered that showed extra push away from the sun without a cometary tail. And it turns out that this was a rocket booster from 1966 uh, in a lunar lander mission. Uh, and astronomers saw it uh, being pushed uh, without a cometary tail. And the reason for that is that it's very thin, this uh, booster, and it has a hollow structure. So we know why, because we produced it. Uh, however, Oumuamua, if it's indeed a very thin structure, must have been produced by someone else. Yeah, and the particular thing of, of Oumuamua is um, actually the, the movement that it did and all the change in the speed. So that, that is also the other different facts that uh, uh, give more, um, let's say, uh, boost to, the, to this hypothesis that we don't know and for sure is not a comet or is not an, an asteroid, correct? Right, so there are uh, about six anomalies uh, about this object that are making it different from anything that we have seen before, any asteroid or comet. And in fact, uh, astronomers, mainstream astronomers that try to argue, well, it should be from a natural origin after my paper appeared, they came up with um, scenarios that involve things that we have never seen before. For example, frozen hydrogen, an ice, hydrogen iceberg that evaporates, but because hydrogen is transparent, we can't see the cometary tail. The problem with that is such an object would evaporate very quickly along the journey through interstellar space by absorbing starlight. We show that in a follow-up paper. So that doesn't work. And then there was another suggestion. Maybe it's a dust bunny, a collection of dust particles uh, the size of a football field, that's the size of a muamua, and uh, uh, more rarefied than air, a hundred times less dense than air. So sort of like a dust cloud that is pushed by sunlight. The problem with that is such a, an object would not be uh, very tightly bound and could easily get disrupted along its journey. Uh, and there was another suggestion that maybe it's a piece of a bigger object that was torn apart when that object passed close to a star. And the problem with that is you will not get from such a process a flat object, a pancake-like object. Most likely you would get elongated cigar-shaped object. So um, altogether, the proposals that were made for a natural origin seem to me less likely. And um, I would say if all of them 
contemplate something that we have never seen before for the first interstellar object that we discovered, then why not also entertain the possibility that it was artificial in origin? And that's why it's nothing that we have seen before. And then, you know, it's just like finding plastic bottle on the beach when you walk. And most of the time you see seashells or rocks that are naturally produced by, but every now and then you notice a plastic bottle that indicates a, an artificial origin. What is quite remarkable here, Professor, is that, I mean, we already mentioned all your credentials, you know, this is not a, a, a crazy person. We have seen a lot of, you know, conspiracy theories and all this misinformation. Um, you have the credentials, you have, you have the knowledge. And, and for you to make these statements, are, 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 they open the, the window to, to, to actually dig or invest more research or, 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 or I mean, that, that's very important to understand that. And this is go to my question. What do you think science mainstream international community rather not to talk about what is known so far about extraterrestrial evidence or information instead of not sharing that information and open a wider window for conspiracy theories and misinformation? You know, you talk right. about the, the, this also like I think at the, at the end of your book. Yeah, so I think that the study of technological signatures from other civilization, based on what I said at the beginning, that life should be quite very common. Uh, so the search for technological signatures should be part of the mainstream of science, especially because the public is extremely interested in this question and the public funds science. So scientists should work on that. They have the instruments to detect those signatures. For example, they can look for industrial pollution in the atmospheres of planets and not just for oxygen that may represent uh, primitive forms of life. And by the way, oxygen is not a good signature of life because the earth didn't have much oxygen in its atmosphere in the first two billion years. So for half of the life of earth, the lifetime, uh, there was not much oxygen in the atmosphere. If you don't find oxygen, it doesn't mean that there are no microbes on the surface of that planet. Uh, but moreover, oxygen can be produced by um, natural processes like breakup of uh, water molecules without life. So um, it would never be conclusive uh, just by finding oxygen that there is life on a planet. However, if we find, for example, CFCs, these are the complex molecules produced by refrigerating systems and industries here on Earth. If we find it on another planet, that would be conclusive because nature does not produce these cos cos complex molecules naturally. So my point is, uh, there is currently a lot of resistance in the mainstream astronomy community to discussing uh, the possibility of technological signatures and, and, and searching for them. And I think that's inappropriate given that it's not speculative at all that they might exist. And also the public is interested. And moreover, um, if you look at the history of science, you know, in the middle ages, for example, uh, some people thought that it's not appropriate to dissect the human body because it has some magical powers because um, there is a soul or, and imagine what would happen if science followed that and said, we don't want to uh, deal with the human body because people say nonsense about it. Uh, then we would not have the medicine we have today. And uh, if, if, if some people make uh, nonsensical statements about extraterrestrial intelligence uh, in science fiction books or uh, related to unidentified flying objects, that doesn't mean anything for science. Science should address the same issues using the scientific methodology and the scientific instruments. And we have that capability now. We should ignore any statements made that may not have scientific credibility and just address uh, this question and try to find an answer for it. Talking about that uh, technology that we have uh, at this moment, this capacity, why we should see the moon as a fishing net for interstellar life, considering the, the 2024 sustainable moon mission, the, the project Artemis? 
Right. So the one uh, nice thing about the moon is, well, first of all, it doesn't have an atmosphere. So every object that impacts the moon lands on the surface, doesn't burn up like meteors in the atmosphere of the Earth. So uh, the moon collects everything that collides with it. Moreover, it doesn't have any geological activity. So in the Earth, there is anything on the surface of the Earth gets mixed up within less than a hundred million years because of geological activity. And, you know, if there was a civilization or if there was any technological equipment landing on Earth more than a hundred million years from now, uh, before now, then uh, it would have been by now buried deep in the Earth. We wouldn't find computer terminal from a billion years ago on Earth. Um, so in the moon, on the other hand, there is no geological activity and everything is preserved. It's sort of like a museum. And uh, we should regard the moon as an archeological site where we can check if anything crashed on the surface of the moon that looks suspicious, that doesn't look like a rock, may look like a piece of technology or may have a life from another star, from another planetary system, because you can imagine some rocks carrying life across in between stars and then colliding with the moon. And then you can, in principle, uh, search for those uh, indications uh, that, that, that they carried light. And uh, overall, it's uh, an, an interesting place to look into. Uh, of course, there, are all, there is also the possibility that some of the objects from interstellar space collided with the Earth. And if so we can look for interstellar meteors. These are objects coming from outside the solar system, just like Oumuamua, but by chance happen to collide with the Earth. And if we find such an object, in principle, if it didn't burn up in the atmosphere and landed on the ground or in the deep ocean, we could put our hands around it because we can get it and check what it's made of and whether it has any interesting uh, information about uh, the source that sent it. Talking about uh, other, other um, interstellar possibility of planets, also you mentioned about the, this uh, Proxima B planet. Uh, does it have atmosphere? Why so special? Yes, so uh, the nearest star to us is Proxima Centauri. It's uh, four and a quarter light years away. So uh, uh, the, sig the results of the elections of 2016 will only get there in February 2021, this year, just in a month. Um, so it, it's uh, at quite a large distance, even the nearest star to us. And then it's so happy. I mean, it's a dwarf star, only 12% of the mass of the sun. So it's uh, very faint. And it happens to have a planet that uh, is close enough to it to, in principle, have liquid water on the surface. It's 20 times closer than the Earth is from the sun. Uh, at that separation, very close to the star, turns out that the planet is most likely to face the star with the same side as it orbits around it. The orbital time, the, the equivalent of one year, is only 11 days. And it faces the star with the same side. So if there are any uh, creatures there, they can celebrate a birthday every 11 days. There are lots of parties there. Um, but actually, the illuminated side, the permanent day side, is warm. And the permanent night side is cold. And if you imagine life, uh, it would be very different than on Earth. First of all, the star itself is half the, has half the temperature of the surface of the sun. So um, it emits mostly infrared radiation and those creatures should have infrared eyes. And uh, it turns out these are the most common stars. The most common stars are dwarf stars that are cooler than the sun and they produce infrared radiation. So if we ever ask why We've never had a visit. Why did the uh, travel agencies from other stars did not advertise our planet? It's because most of the other stars are dwarf stars. And if there are any animals there, they have infrared eyes and they're used to seeing, for example, the, gra the grass is red, the dark red in their, on their planet. And, and they wouldn't regard the green grass that we have with visible light as appealing. They would not find a, the ideal vacation site here on Earth. 
Uh, the most common vacation site for those travel agencies, interstellar travel agencies, would be near a dwarf star like Proxima Centauri. So the life over there would be very different. And obviously the life on the dark side would be extremely different. Uh, my daughters say, suggest that actually the strip between the day side and the night side that has a permanent sunset in it would have the highest real estate because you can build a house there and forever see the sunset. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one, yeah. <laughs> Professor, you, you, you used to say to your students, uh, by looking at the sky, you should develop a sense of modesty. And you mentioned at this beginning of the interview, the word modesty. Uh, why is that? And, and you also mentioned the importance of humility and to be humble. Uh, right. Can you uh, uh, walk us through that statement? Right, so um, I, when you study astronomy, I think if you take it seriously, if you don't do it just to uh, show that you are smart or to, to boost your, your image, if you actually pay attention to what the sky is telling us, uh, it's giving us a very simple message. We should be modest because the universe is so large, because there are 10 to the power 20 planets like the Earth in the observable volume of the universe. So we are occupying just one grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. We cannot be proud of ourselves. Anything we do on earth is really a tiny, tiny part of the entire picture. But beyond that, we also live a short time relative to the age of the universe. Um, you know, and then all of us will die and then the universe will continue for <laughs> uh, a period that is a hundred million times longer. That's the age of the, the universe. So um, altogether, you know, the perspective, if you get this big picture, uh, whatever we do, whatever meaning we give to, the, to our actions cannot really be very substantial or significant in the big scheme of things. That's point number one. But point number two is we may not have, even as living creatures, the best qualities. Uh, we might not be the smartest kid on the block or the sharpest cookie in the jar. And then... Um, we should look around, you know. So the only reason, for example, my daughters, when they were infants, they thought that the world centers on them, that they have special qualities. Once they went out to kindergarten and met uh, other kids, they recognized that, you know, they, there are other kids that have qualities that are better than theirs. And, and they got a, a, a better perspective about life. And, you know, we as a civilization will mature only when we find others. Of course, for now, a lot of people prefer not to look for others because then they can maintain the view that we are special and unique. And that's part of the reason why I get pushback when I suggest uh, that Oumuamua uh, might have been uh, an artificial object because uh, people are not willing, scientists are not willing to consider the possibility it hurts their egos if we are not really the smartest kid in the, on the block. Professor, uh, reading your book, uh, I, I could realize how remarkable has been your life so far. From, from a small farm in Israel to a world-renowned Harvard professor, top 25 most influential uh, people in the world of space research. Uh, how you did it? What's the key for, for, for this success? Or how can you define it? Well, first of all, I should say that I don't, uh, regard uh, the labels that I have uh, very highly because uh, I'm still the same as I was when I was a kid. You know, I'm, I'm curious about the world and trying to figure it out. I don't do political calculations. I don't manipulate people. I just, I'm trying to understand what the world is about. And, and that's part of the reason why I look different. You know, I came out with this statement about this object and the public seems to be extremely interested because the scientific community seemed to starve the public on this issue. So I was working on other subjects in the past, like black holes, cosmology, the study of the universe, the first stars. And I was addressing all the anomalies in those contexts in exactly the same way. You know, if, if there was evidence that the dark matter, most of the matter in the universe is anomalous in some way, I would come up with a suggestion that explains it and put it on the table and then uh, uh, encourage 
my colleagues to collect more data and figure it out. And I applied exactly the same approach in this case. Uh, just like a kid, you know, that is faced with a challenge to understand something, you know, I'm not afraid of being wrong. I may be wrong, but at the same time, you know, we should be open-minded and not have uh, prejudice dictate what we do and not always try to get the, the highest number of likes on Twitter. That is completely irrelevant. We should try to understand nature. So that's my approach. And that was my approach from a young age when I grew up in a farm. You know, I, I'm very connected to nature. Now I, I jog every morning at 5 a.m. because I enjoy being in the company of uh, rabbits, ducks, and the birds, you know, more than company of people. And uh, I don't have any footprint on social media, for example. Now, um, despite all of that, I, I, I have leadership positions, uh, you know, and uh, but I stay straightforward and what you see is what you get. I'm not uh, manipulating anyone or, or trying to calculate how it will be perceived. And I think it very much goes back to how I grew up uh, on a farm and uh, surrounded by nature and being as, learning to be as honest as possible. Uh, and I may be wrong, but uh, I think it's important not to um, hide things uh, from the public, not to the way that some of my colleagues are trying to do. And, you know, in the context of Oumuamua, for example, I attended a seminar with a colleague that is mainstream and they worked on rocks within the solar system for many decades. And when we left the seminar room, he told me, Oumuamua is so weird, I wish it never existed. And I found this uh, statement to be completely inappropriate for a scientist because we should always be happy at what nature tells us uh, you know we part of the work as a scientist is to allow nature to give us a message so that we update our view of of nature and uh, it's a learning experience and we can be wrong we can have the wrong conception and then we do experiments collect evidence and recalculate just like a gps system and then uh, uh, so that's the way I operate and I didn't change my approach and I'm not doing any calculation and there is some pushback from the community, but my hope is that I'm doing it even though, you know, I'm not necessarily benefiting from it. I, I do it because I, I think that in the future, the younger generation should have the opportunity to discuss these topics freely uh, without being bullied. And, uh, you know, part of the problem is that when uh, you discourage young people from uh, exploring uh, technological signatures from other civilizations. And when you do not, you block funding for this search, then obviously nothing will be found. If you're not open to, to discoveries of wonderful things, you will never find them. And then um, it's just like stepping on the grass and saying, look, the grass doesn't grow. Um, and then um, I very much, uh, ho I'm hopeful that uh, in the future, this will change. Do you think, Professor, that uh, humanity is um, actually ready to, to uh, be open to the possibility of extraterrestrial life? I think the public is definitely ready. <laughs> the public is extremely interested. And given the fact that people in academia start as kids, uh, and as kids, they would be very interested in this subject. The only step that is remaining is to let these kids remain kids and not uh, become the adults that we see now in academia as tenured professors that refuse to discuss some topics. I mean, I don't think it's appropriate. I think they sh people should be driven by curiosity. And if we have the means of exploring a subject scientifically, we should do it. Uh, why should we stop ourselves? Why should we always focus on physical objects in the universe and not consider the search for life? I have a textbook uh, together with a, a former postdoc of mine, uh, Manas Vilingam, that will come out in six months, 870 pages long, that talks about the subject of the search for both primitive and technological uh, civilized uh, life out there. And um, um, I encourage people that are interested in getting into this field to look at this book, a textbook, but in addition to the book that we are discussing, I think it's the wave of the future. I think it's very exciting and we might find an answer within our lifetime. You know, in my book, I talk about the fact that 
Winston Churchill in 1939, he wrote an essay about how exciting it is to search for life uh, around other stars. And then the Second World War started, so he was drafted to become prime minister. He couldn't really pursue this subject that he was very interested in. And look at what humanity did uh, in this uh, fight against the Nazi regime. A lot of people died, you know, a lot of money was wasted. If instead Churchill would have been able to use those, those funds that were channeled to destructive uh, measures, if he would, was able to direct them towards uh, the search for life on, around other stars, we may have known the answer by now. Professor Love, last question, and we really appreciate your time. What would be your best advice for the people, I would say for the new generation, that, that is not open to the possibility that it might be intelligent life beyond us? Well, my recommendation is uh, to, to, to be as modest as possible, not to assume that we are special and unique because that never worked in the past when uh, humans thought that they have a privileged uh, position or a privileged, they live in a privileged time. Uh, and then collect evidence, basically educate yourself based on what nature tells you rather than having a prejudice. Again, a, that turned out throughout history to be a better approach. You know, nobody could have dreamt about quantum mechanics, which is a main pillar of modern physics, without the experiments telling us about it. And in fact, Einstein had a problem accepting the premise of quantum mechanics, and he was wrong. So uh, the lesson from all of that is even the smartest person of the 20th century uh, who resisted the notion of quantum mechanics was wrong. We, let, we better let nature educate us, look at the evidence, rather than assume that we know the answer in advance. And in the context of um, Oumuamua, it's a signal that we should search uh, the objects that enter the solar system from outside. And the next one that looks peculiar, just like Oumuamua, and we could find it with, uh, for example, the Vera Rubin Observatory that will come into operation in three years, and will be much more sensitive than the pan stars telescope that discovered Oumuamua. We might find one per month. So the next object that looks peculiar, uh, if, if we catch it when it's approaching us, we can send a spacecraft with a camera that will take a close up photo. And then we will know for sure whether it looks like a rock or something else. Harvard astronomy professor Abraham Love author of Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for being on the Millennial Way Show. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Until our next one. Well, there you have it. Abraham A.B. Love. He is the author of Extraterrestrial. First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth is uh, published, it will be released January 26, very, very highly recommended. And uh, as the author said, to be open, to be modest, to be humble to the option that we are not alone in this uh, vast universe. Thank you very much for watching. Remember that this interview, you can watch it in all our social media platforms, in YouTube, in Facebook, in Twitter. We are also in SoundCloud, in Spotify, in iHeartRadio, among many other podcast uh, versions. This is the Millennial Way Show, empowering the new generations. Millennial.